Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm Tonya Akins. I'm the president and CEO of Howard County Library System. And I thank you so much for taking part of your morning to learn more about this opportunity, the Lakefront Library. I'm gonna walk you through some slides, some information, and then we'll save some time at the end for any questions that you may have. Christy's given you a comment card. You're welcome to note your question there. She'll come around when we're at that portion of our time together, collect them up and we'll do our best to answer as many of them as possible. We also want you to know that there's a very robust, because it gets longer and longer with each one of these sessions, um, FAQ on our website, there's a Lakefront Library page uh, with lots of information, even links to the various plans and reports that I'll reference during my presentation today. So we just wrapped National Library Week, uh, and the theme was so key to what we're discussing now in Howard County, I thought I would continue to share it, right? So our national theme is there's more to the story. Libraries always have a lot to relay about what today's library is. What's actually offered through our spaces? What are the opportunities and the ways that people are engaging? It can be very easy to think about uh, the library of our youth, to be very nostalgic about libraries, but libraries across the nation are providing all of these services and more. Sometimes it can also be easy to assume that the ways that we engage with libraries or anything is the way that others engage, and that isn't always true either. And so we offer you this and we'll walk through some of these opportunities as it relates to uh, this proposed Lakefront Library and the things that we're offering in libraries here in Howard County already. So I'm gonna start with Dokken, um, also called Doc One, but in Denmark, they say Dokken. Dokken uh, is one of the libraries of the world, so designated in 2016 by the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions. And this is important because uh, Dokken has become this model for libraries and even for communities uh, with regard to transforming city centers, right? So Dawkins sits at the mouth of the Ohaus River uh, in one of the most prominent sites, right? And this river had kind of, you know, a traffic had gone down and actual interactivity had gone down. Um, and so it was there, beautiful space, but underutilized, right? And along comes Dawkin, completed in 2015. And you can see the square footage there is just over 383,000 square feet for a population that's smaller than that, right? And I give you that because this is not the only library that they have. And so we'll talk about some of the standards for library space here in Maryland, but that's important that the square footage for the library exceeds one square foot per capita. Okay, um, you'll see in the first seven months of this build, they welcomed over a million visitors and Dokken now um, hosts an international conference for libraries every year and people just convene there from all across the earth. You'll see their quote there from Marie who is now their library director at the time she was their project manager. And Marie says, this shows us that we've been starving part of the population because we were so focused on the book, right? Um, there's been an unmet need in society that's now being addressed. And you can see this here. And I will tell you, this is not just for a photo. This is not a staged photo. Like if you go to Dawkin, if you're, I don't even know if you can zoom in it on Google Earth, like it will look like this. I've had the opportunity to visit this space, um, to talk with their library director and to talk with the architects there about the vision uh, and about libraries. This is a true statement. It is so wonderful, it's now on a stamp in Denmark. That's that photo in the center I wanna draw your attention to. It's a photo of this tubular gong that hangs in Dokken. And yes, it is a beautiful art feature, um, but it's even more than that. Uh, and so in Dokken, this structure is actually connected to their local hospital so that when a new family welcomes a new 
life um, into the world, there's a button in the hospital they can press that actually, I know, Colleen, sounds this gong in Dokken, right? And I said to them, so this thing is massive, you can see the scale of it. Um, doesn't this interrupt everything that is happening in the library though, right? Um, and they looked at me like, you American, <laughs> like, of course, like this is a beautiful thing. Like they don't even see it as an interruption, right? This is not only welcoming life to community, but welcoming life and connecting to education, right? Connecting to this place of value, the public library where everyone is welcome and where community, right, is focused. So right at the heart of community here is where all of this takes place. It is absolutely beautiful. Lots to learn about Doc, and I encourage you to explore it. <coughs> this is Fayetteville Public Library in Arkansas. Um, they had an existing build that was about 90,000 square feet and they added an additional 100,000 square feet. And you can see their population size there. And I will tell you that while their population is just over 95,000, this is not their only location, right? So again, talking about how folks use space and why social infrastructure is so important. And you can see some of the spaces there that they have in this new build, uh, their auditorium, their computer lab, their literacy kitchen, and we'll talk more about what a literacy kitchen is in a bit. Um, and you'll see what um, their director and their mayor have to say about this, right? This community loves its library, and that is most genuinely expressed in their willingness to continue to invest in its future, right? Our community loves its library too. Um, and we hear that every day and we're so appreciative. Um, the mayor there, if you're going to have a world-class city, you have to have a world-class library and we've got a world-class library. I think we've got a world-class library as well. So lots of opportunity there. This is Missoula in Montana. They are the 2022 Library of the World. So the same designation that was, the same honor that was bestowed upon Dawkin, uh, Missoula has earned. And Missoula is actually the first library in North America to claim this honor. Uh, they are the library there at 106,000 square feet with a population of about 75,000. And again, this is not their only location. They've got other branches in this system situated right um, near the river with the mountains as a backdrop there. And you can see a lot of the spaces that they have, the children's area and lounge, STEM focused areas, a teaching kitchen, the flexible meeting space, the maker space uh, and a cafe. We just completed some listening and engagement sessions with our community. We had went out in 20, 2019, pre-pandemic, around our facilities and updated our facilities master plan. Uh, we went back out and just wrapped that um, uh, listening and engagement with Dewey's partners. And these are some of the things we're hearing from community uh, about the way they want to engage with the library now, right? Um, I draw your attention to the bottom, and I won't read all of those off to you, um, but 94%. And um, we listened and engaged over 900 folks in community. 94% said that they engage with the library at a physical location, right? And this doesn't mean that they don't use our virtual services, right? That they don't use any of our electronic resources, but they still desire to engage in person. I don't know if you've seen the Surgeon General's latest report on the epidemic of loneliness. It is a real issue. Uh, and one of the things that he says in that report, our nation's doctor, is that uh, this epidemic of loneliness is weighing so heavily on our health that it is equivalent to smoking 15 cigarettes a day. 15 cigarettes a day because we've allowed ourselves to become so isolated and because our communities don't necessarily all have the social infrastructure that people need, right? That's really important, really, really important. This is the existing central branch and you'll see these three photos here. These are of the three instructional spaces that exist at the current location. And they're about as big as you see there, um, that th these are really capturing the space. Um, 
If you haven't been into the central branch lately, I, I encourage you to go and visit, right? Having seen some of these um, photos of spaces at other libraries and you can search and find your own um, and then go and compare. And what I tell people is two things can be true, right? Multiple things can be true, but certainly of our library system, it is fantastic. It is wonderful. Right? So this takes nothing away from who we are and what we do. It has the opportunity to be much better because there's a lot missing. We turn people away all the time. And one of the complexities that we deal with here in Howard County is a very diverse, highly engaged, highly educated community. So there's a lot of demand on the resources and the space, right? And then that space and those resources also need to be diversified, right? They need to look very different for very different audiences to make sure that everyone sees themselves reflected in our services, not only in the collections, not just the books, but in the actual speaker events, in the classes, right? All of that is space. And then also, Howard County benefits from really having an engaged community where there are lots of people working to do good here in the county. So one of the highest requests that we receive is for community meeting space, use of spaces like this by nonprofits, whether formal groups, uh, informal groups in community that wanna get together, um, have a conversation, a book club or some other uh, group and, and really turn around some good ROI to the community. Right. Um, we also use these spaces for classes and events, so we share them with community. At the Central Branch, their uh, largest space is here on the bottom, and it's about this size. It's, it's not much bigger than this. Um, it's about this size, and that space doubles as their uh, adult classroom and really their teen classroom. So if they're having an event, it's also here. If they're having a speaker, it's also here. And this is also the space that they share with community, right? Up here, you'll see their children's classroom and then a classroom that we've turned over um, for teens uh, and for other events. But that's it. That's it. So when you see this bank, when you're here at the Elkridge branch, you see this bank of meeting rooms uh, for small group collaboration, that's not at Central. There are a couple of spaces and that's it, right? So there's just a deficit of space. I will say also while you're here um, to look at for the teen space and when you go to Central to look for the teen space because there is no teen space at Central. Right? There's not only a deficit of teen space across our library system, there is a deficit of space for teens in Howard County. And that is a problem, right? We know that, right, our young people, we've got space for them and um, we welcome them into our spaces with all types of activities and resources. And somehow when they get to be preteen and teen, that goes away. Um, and Again, if you can find it, let me know because we keep hearing the requests for it. It does not exist. Uh, and we have to change that as well. There's a key opportunity here. I walked you through some of the spaces and I'll tell you a little bit more about them, but at the Central Branch, there is no early learning interactive space. Um, and this is really important because the latest uh, MSDE report card shows that only 54% of Howard County young students are testing ready for kindergarten. That number is lower for children of color and we can do better in Howard County. We can do better. We know that the library is a pathway to preschool and kindergarten, that your K-12 education is a pathway to college and career, right? We need the early learning infrastructure and we hear the request for it all the time. Um, our customers will tell us, I'm going to Storyville in Baltimore County library system. I want that here in Howard County. We have heard that for years. It showed up in our strategic planning, listening and engagement eons ago. It showed up in our facilities master planning and we're hearing it again when we just went out for these listening and engagement sessions. We don't have an auditorium or large class event space. And this is important, right? Even for some of our own events, um, we will you know, see if we can use HCC's parking lot or some of their space. Um, if there are complaints that come into my office, it is usually I could not get into the class or event or I could not park at the central branch. And they are real valid complaints, 
right? Um, and so we know that. And we know that when we're going out for certain speakers or authors, they will have a seat minimum that you need to guarantee, right, to be able to book them, right? And often we're not able to meet that, so we're not able to invite them, okay? So very important there as well. No teen space, no maker space, no literacy kitchen, no connection to the outdoor environment, right? All things that we have the opportunity to shift. So early learning, right? I talked about this statistic. Uh, this is what some of those spaces can look like, all of these in public library spaces, right? Most communities do not have early learning infrastructure, and they've begun doing that through their public library systems, right? Baltimore County now has two, um, and they are part of key library bills, as you see in the Bloomberg quote there from 2022. It's now common for big ticket library projects by acclaimed architects to showcase a elaborate early childhood spaces, and that is because of the lack of early learning infrastructure. So this is a key opportunity for us. I don't know if you know about project literacy. Um, it is one of uh, maybe the county's best kept secrets. Um, it's a beautiful program with high rewards uh, and impact here locally. So you'll see some of the data there around this program. This is a adult education program. Uh, for those that are without a high school diploma, and then also for um, skilled immigrants who come to the U.S. So we know that many of our community members come to us uh, from other countries, sometimes with one and two degrees um, that don't transfer here right, uh, in the United States. And so they connect with us through the Project Literacy Program and are able to earn their external high school diploma. I don't know if you knew that the library system issues external high school diplomas to adults, but we do. We're actually authorized to do this through the Department of Education and we receive federal funds for this program. It is one of the most beautiful experiences you'll ever have if you come out to a Project Literacy graduation and are able to hear some of the stories from adults who are already living and working here in the county who are able to upskill and then provide even better for their families and for this community. This uh, program uh, has a wait list that is usually between 40 and 90 people. Yeah, absolutely, right? And so again, it suffers for the space. Um, so we would love to be able to move more people through that, that program and be able to meet the demand that we continue to see. So literacy kitchens, what are they and why in the world would there be a kitchen in a library? I can tell you that these are becoming more and more common. The first was actually in Philadelphia, right? So local to us. Um, and you'll see that there's one now in neighboring Carroll County, right? Um, these spaces are really spaces to engage multiple literacies and even to help some people overcome barriers um, to being engaged in STEM, right? Or in reading, right? Um, and then also to provide intergenerational opportunities and health and wellness opportunities. So lots of things happening through this space and I'll give you some examples. Um, they will hold in Carroll County, uh, for example, a Harry Potter cooking class, right? Well, they'll encourage the young people to have read Harry Potter before they come to the class or to engage with it in some way, right? They come to the class, they've got the screens there, the monitors, and they'll flash Jeopardy style questions, right? Quizzes around the reading. Uh, and then when they get it right, you know, there's lots of celebration across the family uh, or the group that's in there. They will make things that are mentioned in the book, whether the recipe is included in the book or not, right? So in Harry Potter, they talk about the butterbeer, they talk about some pumpkin pie, they talk about these, they talk about frogs, they make chocolate frogs, you know, these types of things. But all the while, the students in this class are making their way through reading, they're making their way through math concepts, through measuring, they're making their way through chemistry, right? And, and combining different ingredients. And all of these things are happening. And then at the end of the class, they're able to tell them, right? Here's all the learning that you just went through, right? It is fantastic. And it's a different entry point, right? Than telling a young person, come sit down with me and do fractions, right? Let's, let's work on fractions today, but we can do it, right? 
through this, right? And you'd be amazed at the level of engagement. And then also, right, you're engaging the whole family, which is nice as well. And that's something that we've heard, right? When I come in with my family, I'd love some space where we can engage together, right? Rather than this one having to go to this section and that one having to go that section and I've got to go somewhere else, right? We've also heard through our listening from seniors in the community that they would like more intergenerational opportunities, right? Whether it's with their family or not, more intergenerational opportunities in community, right? And we think that's a beautiful thing. So we'd love to be able to do something like this. Carroll County is also um, connected and collaborating with their local hospital to do things like cooking for diabetes, right? Um, how to gain a lot of the nutrition back after you have undergone chemotherapy, right? Various things that are also of huge benefit to community. Okay, so this is a key opportunity for us to advance multiple liter literacies through cooking and engagement, right? Um, they have uh, a space that is their maker space, also here on the bottom. So this maker space, and this is on an existing build, this is not a new library. This is an existing build where they added um, or transformed the basement area of their library to uh, put in this maker space and the literacy kitchen. And so the makerspace sits right next door. They will have classes where you can come to the makerspace and fashion a charcuterie board and then come back to the cooking class the next day and learn how to plate it, right? So all kinds of things that are just wonderful, not only knowledge, but community building opportunities. One of the things that is so beautiful about public libraries is that they are key community building spaces because everybody is welcome there, right? There is no hurdle to overcome to come into a library, right? Um, you don't have to live in the area. You don't have to pay anything. You don't have to necessarily be of a certain age or whatever status. You're welcome there and that is very important. And so we see our libraries as bumping places where people in community are very likely to bump into someone that they don't normally bump into. And that's how community gets to know community better, how we're able to better leverage the assets that exist in community. Okay, so maker spaces, what are these things? These are wonderful STEM centers, right, of exploration and instruction. That's really all it is, right? It is a STEM center for exploration and instruction. It's a hands-on hands -on space, so it can be a classroom, environment. It can also be um, a free learning environment um, where you can go in um, self-instructed in these spaces. Um, they are very common in libraries. We have, through our recent renovation of the Glenwood branch, put in a few tools to create a smaller maker space. So there is a, a 3D printer there, a laser cutter engraver, and some other tools there in the maker space, but it's nothing like this. Right, and I give you this because these spaces are very different. Right, we were we did what we were able to do in the space that we had, um, with the funding that we had. But this is not a full-on maker space in the way that most libraries know them. Right, um, this does not exist in Howard County, and it should. Um, if you look at that snowflake tool there, it's called a hexflex. Um, this was actually fashioned in 2012 in a Sacramento library in California. Right? So we have some catching up to do. When I tell you that things can be simultaneously true, right? our library system is amazing and we're offering amazing things. Simultaneously, we have some catching up to do. Right, um, We don't have the early learning space in our library system for our community. We don't have a maker space. Right? We don't have the space for large gatherings um, and author events and, and instruction and collaboration. So there were two cousins that visited the Sacramento Public Library, uh, they're snowboarders, and we're tired of packing all the gear. Uh, so they fashioned this tool in the makerspace there that has several different screwdriver heads um, and a bottle cap opener. So they could carry one thing. They printed it out on the 3D printer there, they placed it on Kickstarter, got the money, and now you can just about buy this, right, uh, any day of the week, and it comes in different kinds of metal. Um, but, but what an opportunity, and when I think about 
the opportunity, right? And that's what is the value um, here is that our community, our young people um, in our community should have the same opportunities, right? There is rich talent here in Howard County that could, right, be creating some of these things that could be engaged in this type of learning um, if the resources were available to them and we're striving to do that. This is important um, as we talk about how we really want to, as a community, provide for and engage our young people, right? This isn't only for young people, but this is attractive to young people. And that's something for us to remember. I'm gonna play this video and then we'll get into this library. So that's the opportunity before us, right? The first thing I want to remind us is that this is conceptual at this point, right? So this design, if approved by the Howard County Council, would actually um, then move, we've moved forward with planning and design. Uh, there would be a local procurement process for an architect of record, a local architect uh, and construction firm to move the conceptual designs into buildable drawings, okay? So everything that needs to happen with the concept would happen, meaning in the way of ADA accessibility, in the way of sustainability, right? We build to, to lead silver minimum, uh, in the way of uh, avian friendly windows, windows and all of the other things that are uh, requirements for our county, okay? So even if you don't see that there. Also, when you see the steps, please know that's not the only way to access uh, the building. There's actually a ground floor, so you can just walk right in. Um, you don't have to traverse the, the stairs, although the stairs are there in the concept, okay? Uh, in the interior, where you see all of those stairs, um, it gave you the day view and the night view. That's the same space. And one of the key things we talked about with this design is building for flexibility. We need something that can grow with us because communities continue to change and libraries continue to change. Um, there's a wonderful brain uh, called Ranganathan. Uh, Ranganathan is really like the father of library science in many ways. And he's got like five laws. And one of those laws is that the library is an organism right, that the library will continue to change over time. Those five laws were published in, I think, 1931. Um, so even then there was this, but then also knowing that the book 
is a tool, right? Libraries are about people. Libraries are not about books. The book is a tool for people to engage with, right? To draw and glean information from, to enhance their being, right? And the well-being of society, right? Um, so even though the tools change, right? The purpose of libraries remain the same, right? And I think that's key for us to remember also. Um, wanted to just help you get your bearings because we've had some questions on exactly where this sits and would anything that is existing at the lakefront be demolished to make way for the library? And the answer is no. So the library actually would sit on existing spaces in the Whole Foods parking lot. So if you are standing on Little Patuxent looking at Whole Foods, it's this parking lot spaces that are right here, right? So just surface lot. Um, a little under 200 of those spaces would go away to make use for this library. Those spaces would be replaced in a structured garage with one level of underground parking, okay? Um, this uh, library space or structured garage would also have uh, approximately 200 spaces um, as proposed for library customers and then additional um, spaces for other uses around the lakefront. So about 500 spaces in total as proposed now and again at concept. Important thing to know about the parking is that currently there is no public parking at the lakefront right? We are using it as public parking. It is privately held. There is zero public parking at the lakefront. And this opportunity is an opportunity to claim this space for community. And I cannot stress that enough. There is currently an approved use for this proposed site. The approved use is an up to 15 story building. Howard Hughes holds this approval through the planning process currently, right? So it's this or that, right? This area will be developed. A lot of the development that you see happening, all of it actually, in the Meriwether District is part of the downtown Columbia plan, which also calls for development across the lakefront in what will be the lakefront district, right? So you see the, Mary, um, the medical office building that's going up now um, next to Whole Foods, there'll be a lot more development that comes online. So if we don't claim some public space um, for the public, we won't have a chance to do that once the development continues, right? Um, so I think that's an important thing for us to remember. And if you frequent the lakefront, you will know that there are porta potties there. There are porta potties there because there's no public amenity at the lakefront, right? So we talk about connections with nature, right? Preserving the best spaces in community for community, right? Really wanting to help our community with its mental wellness and what we know being outdoors does for that. Why would we not preserve some space at the lakefront for the community, right? Um, we've also heard the library will block the views of the lake. No, the library is giving the views of the lake to the community because something else will block the views of the lake, right? Um, so again, please understand that there is no option for this to remain a surface lot. That is not currently an option. And I think that's important for everyone to know. And then also that the spaces are being replaced in the structured uh, garage under this plan. Front side of the building, we've been asked about, oh, I just have to see if I have the back side. I'll go to this first. So you'll see this slide. There was a beautiful human in community when we started talking about this. I did not find this, so I'm giving credit where credit is due, um, that sent this to us and said, this was Jim Rouse's vision. There is actually in the Columbia archives, this that cites the library that you see the retail there in red and just underneath theater library exhibition, right? Had no idea um, when we began talking about this, um, but for those that would say this, this goes against everything Jim Rouse would want, that's not true. And here's the proof of that, right? So what about the money, right? That's a big deal also. So you can see the funding sources for the Lakefront Library. 80 million of this uh, comes from the Downtown Columbia TIF, right? Or the Tax Increment Financing Fund. This fund was created to support development in downtown. And there are several projects that are to be 
uh, supported by the TIF. So 80 million of this comes from the TIF. And I will tell you that when you break down the $143 million cost of this project, 94 million is the library. Uh, about 35 million is the garage and the remainder is the library frontage, right? Um, and so this fund, uh, there is an analysis on our website. You can go directly to the report from Sage Policy Group um, that has the analysis on the TIF um, and how it is overperforming currently. So the projections for the fund um, were at one point, it's actually doing better than those projections, right? Which is a good thing for us. Um, 80 million from the TIF, but I do encourage you, look at that analysis. Um, they are actually the ones who would say whether this fund can support all of the projects that it is designed to support. So the experts have come back and told the county, yes, it can, here's the report. This is why and how we arrived at 80 million, okay? 26 million in county-backed GO bonds. I would tell you that this 26 million is less of an ask of the county than at the previous site in the Meriwether District in the Crescent. So there's a site that is called for for this project in the downtown Columbia plan that is opposite Colorburst Park, kind of in the corner, uh, opposite Busboys and Poets, um, across Colorburst Park in the corner. Um, to be cited uh, for this project. When we were proposing this to the council last year, our ask in GEO bonds was uh, 34 million. So we're actually down in this new site. 20 million in grants that do not require a local match from the state of Maryland. And that 10 million of that is actually the FY24 ask. There is no ask of county funding in fiscal year 24. It is only for the council to agree to accept the 10 million that the, that the state has put forward for us to advance planning and design. 10 million in philanthropic dollars. And I will tell you that because this design has already made its way across the globe, um, we've received lots of interest already, right? We haven't even begun the ask, but it's a big opportunity. And this is usually what happens, right? When you have something that is well-cited with a well-known architect, well, then people want to be a part of that, right? And so 10 million in philanthropic dollars, 6 million in library grants from the Maryland State Library's Capital Grant program. Uh, all of our buildings here in Howard County have benefited from this program and we've done uh, renovations or new builds or expansions. Um, uh, CEO Angela Braid is sitting here who um, deserves all of that good credit um, along with this team who's done some great work over the years uh, to really enhance the libraries here in Howard County. So six million from that fund uh, and then uh, 1.2 million from the downtown Columbia public Permanent Public Improvement Fund, right? So again, uh, funding that is uh, designated for downtown Columbia. And I would say that this funding path or this project timeline is over four to five years. So we're looking if we actually get approval in this year, we would begin planning and design in FY24 with a ribbon cutting in FY27, 28, right? Okay. Let me see if I have the backside of this building because I thought I did. We get questions on that. Oh, I'm hoping I do. I don't. I'm gonna find it while Christy looks for uh, questions and we'll begin taking the questions. Anyone I'm just gonna go black here while I find the backside. Just a second, just see if I can. Oh no, you're good. There we go. Okay, there we go. 
So you can see here um, kind of what the back side of this uh, would look like. Um, there have been a lot of feedback from community um, on some of the garages off of 29 in the Meriwether District um, and wanting something that looked less like a garage <laughs> um, because everybody's got to pass by it. And this one certainly, right, doesn't, it backs up to Little Patuxent, so it doesn't back up to the woods or anything like that. It will be fully uh, in view. Uh, and so not wanting it to look like there was a backside of the building uh, necessarily. So um, this is what this is conceptually rendered to look like. 